name is Anjan Chakravarti. I'm the director of the Institute for the History and Philosophy of Science and Technology here at the University of Toronto. I'm delighted to welcome you to what I think is going to be a very stimulating and productive discussion this evening. Our topic for tonight is Access Denied, Medicine, Trust, and Experimental Treatments. I'm sure those of you who keep up with the newspapers or listen to the radio appreciate very well how topical the issue of experimental treatments is at the moment. As it happens, tonight's lecture is one in a national series of lectures that's happening across the country, sponsored jointly by the Canadian Centre for Ethics and Public Affairs and the Situating Science Knowledge Cluster, dedicated to promoting humanistic and social studies of science in Canada. The National Lecture Series is entitled Science and Its Publics, and before we dig into our topic for tonight, I'd like to introduce Chris Stover, the General Manager of the Canadian Centre for Ethics and uh, in Public Affairs, to tell us a little bit about the series. Thanks, Anjan. Good evening, everyone. As Anjan mentioned, I am Chris Stover, the General Manager of the Canadian Centre for Ethics in Public Affairs, or CICEPA which is a joint initiative of the Atlantic School of Theology and St. Mary's University in Halifax. I'd like to welcome you here tonight on behalf of our board and our executive director, Dr. Sheila Brown, our collaborating partner, the Situating Science Knowledge Cluster, and all our supporters. SESEPA provides an arena for critical thinking, public discussion, and research into current ethical challenges in our society. Ethics in Public Affairs is about how the values of individuals and organizations interact and evolve to enable us to work together more effectively. The Situating Science Knowledge Cluster is a social scientists and humanities research council of Canada funded project promoting communication and collaboration among humanists and social scientists engaged in the study of science and technology. The Science and Its Public's National Lecture Series aims to encompass both those mandates. Our groups are very pleased to have this opportunity to offer up these important public conversations about science and its relationship to the public. This is a multi-part series examining the role of the public in the translation and the understanding of this knowledge of science, and we've done this by hosting presentations in several Canadian cities, including Halifax, Montreal, Saskatoon, Edmonton and Calgary. An outline of the full details of this series can be found on the SESEPA or the Situating Science websites or on the information table outside. You can have a peek and see what all our groups are up to. Prior events in this series include presentations on science and the media, Frankenstein in the public sphere, and provenance and the role of the public museum. They'll all be viewable on the SESEPA and Situating Science websites. The series moves west next, where Dr. Margaret Locke of McGill University will present a talk entitled Facing Uncertainty, Who is Destined for Alzheimer's Disease? This event will be presented in Saskatoon and reprised in both Edmonton and Calgary. The Edmonton event can be viewed live on the SESEPA and Situating Science websites on March 24th. Before I go, there are some evaluation sheets on your chair in front of you. If you could take the time to fill those out before you leave, we'd greatly appreciate knowing how we do with these types of public presentations. And now I'll let you get to it. Thanks a lot, Chris. In addition to the Canadian Centre for Ethics and Public Affairs and the Situating Science Cluster, a few others have made tonight's events possible, and I'd just like to mention them, if I may. Uh, we're grateful for the support of York University, as well as a number of units here at the University of Toronto, including my own, the Institute for the History and Philosophy of Science and Technology, uh, the Joint Centre for Bioethics, uh, and the Neuroscience Program in the Faculty of Medicine here. And to say just a few words on behalf of the latter, I'd like to introduce Dr. Michael Failings, um, who, as well as being part of the Neuroscience Program, uh, also holds the Kremble Chair in Neural Repair and Regeneration at Toronto Western Hospital. Good evening. I'm uh, Michael Failings. Um, I'm director of the University of Toronto Neuroscience uh, Program. And um, on behalf of the Neuroscience Program, very pleased uh, to be involved uh, in tonight's event, which I think is very important in terms of trying to uh, link what we in uh, science and medicine can offer the public, but then also some of the, the, the ethical uh, challenges that this uh, poses. And I think tonight's uh, uh, event will be a, quite an important event from that uh, 
from that uh, a perspective, and um, I think it will be, um, I hope, uh, uh, very, very informative, and I'm, I know it will be uh, quite lively. So it's a pleasure for our program to be involved, and personally, I'm looking forward to tonight very much. Thank you, Michael. Okay, then without further ado, let's dive into the topic at hand. Access denied, medicine, trust, and experimental treatments. As I intimated earlier, recent controversies surrounding experimental treatments in the context of multiple sclerosis have attracted a great deal of attention in the media recently. But this is just one instance exemplifying a number of important issues facing, facing patient, patients, doctors, medical researchers, and we as a society more generally who may wish to know how best to act or what policy measures to support in the face of new and unproven medical treatments, especially in cases of most desperate illness. We have a distinguished panel here today to discuss these issues. Uh, we'll begin with some remarks by Dr. Jonathan Kimmelman, Associate Professor in the Biomedical Ethics Unit and Social si uh, Studies of Medicine, Faculty of Medicine at McGill University. We'll then have some responses and further discussion from the rest of the panel, which I'll leave uh, Jonathan to introduce, followed by some uh, questions uh, for the panel, I hope, uh, from the floor. And as tonight's proceedings are being webcast live, if you're currently at home watching this on your computer screen, uh, don't be shy about submitting a question later or now for that matter. Jonathan Kimmelman holds a PhD in molecular bio biophysics and biochemistry. His research at McGill concerns ethical, social, and policy dimensions of testing novel medical treatments. He served and continues to serve on a number of ethics committees, including the CIHR Stem Cell Oversight Committee. And his book, Gene Transfer and the Ethics of First in Human Trials, Lost in Translation, was published recently by Cambridge University Press. Okay, well, thanks very much for the invitation. Uh, it's really a, a treat to be able to address an audience that's probably more diverse than the audiences that I'm used to addressing. November 2009, Canadians awoke to a provocative story in the Globe and Mail about a radical new theory about the cause of multiple sclerosis, chronic cerebral spinal venous insufficiency, or CCVSI for short. Now, Standard ways of treating multiple sclerosis aim at trying to dial back the immune system. It's an autoimmune disorder, after all. But the theory of CCSVI proposed that multiple sclerosis is caused by insufficient drainage of uh, the blood that supplies the central nervous system, and thus proposed that one strategy for treating multiple sclerosis might be through implantation of stents in the veins that drain the head. The proposal inevitably invited very contentious debates that continue to echo today about the quality of evidence and about whether patients should have access to this new approach. Rewind back now five years earlier, different disease, similar kind of dynamic. This time following the biotech company Amgen's decision to halt development of its Parkinson's disease candidate GDNF. They halted development after finding in a, a placebo-controlled trial that GDNF seemed to perform no better than placebo, and meantime, ongoing studies uncovered unexpected toxicities uh, in non-human primates. Nevertheless, patients participating in that study took IMGen to court seeking access for continued treatment with GDNF. Rewind back now, still a few years earlier, when Frank Burroughs, the father of this girl, Abigail Burroughs, petitions the FDA and the biotech company Imclone for access to cetuximab, a drug that at that time had not yet shown definitive evidence of safety and efficacy for treatment of cancer. Following his daughter's death from cancer, Frank Burroughs founded this organization, the Abigail Alliance, to press a constitutional challenge in the United States for the right of patients with untreatable disorders to have access to treatments that have not yet demonstrated efficacy or safety. The case ultimately reached the Supreme Court, which let stand the lower court rulings 
upholding the constitutionality of keeping drugs that have not yet demonstrated efficacy from the market. Now, CCSVI, GDNF, Cetuximab, interesting as each one of these episodes are, and raw still the debates about access, I don't want to spend the evening discussing the merits of each individual case here. Instead, what I'd like to do is to use the three cases as a springboard for discussing a series of recurrent challenges in contemporary medicine. Namely, at what point in a trajectory from a medical hypothesis through to a validated treatment do we begin to allow private decision making to determine when a patient gets access to a new treatment? And when medical opinion, mainstream medical opinion, is not aligned with the opinion of segments of a patient community, that is, when patient communities hold on to views that might not be standard within the medical community, how do we broker and resolve these kinds of controversies in a way that serves the mutual objective of advancing the best interests of patients who bear the, the burden of incurable illness? I want to make four key arguments tonight. First, I want to argue that the process of drug development is lengthy, highly uncertain, and very error-prone. That most drugs that enter into clinical development never make it through to the other side as safe and effective treatments. However, I also want to argue that we don't necessarily serve the interests of patients by denying them access to treatments that have not yet shown definitive evidence of efficacy and safety. However, I also want to argue that private decisions about access to unproven drugs have very important public consequences and that there are public interest grounds for restricting access to drugs that have not yet shown evidence of efficacy or safety. And finally, I want to argue that given the contentiousness of these kinds of debates, uh, the recurrency um, and the misalignment sometimes of opinion within mainstream medical community and patient communities, it's crucial for maintaining trust uh, and productivity within the scientific enterprise that we develop novel mechanisms of accountability uh, for decisions and disputes concerning access and evidence. Okay, so my first argument, therapy development, lengthy, uncertain, and failure prone. So countries like Canada and the United States spend enormous amounts of money on biomedical research. 2008, for example, the US, the United States spent $88 billion. Just to give you an idea of the size of this number, this is roughly the GDP of Morocco. Now, about two-thirds of this spending comes from private sources, private sources whose expenditures are primarily directed at developing drugs. But unfortunately, despite the substantial spending, only for every 10 drugs that enter into clinical development, only one will make it through to the other side as demonstrated safe and effective treatment. And unfortunately, for central nervous system disorders, and for cancer, conditions for which there are often uh, debates about access to unproven therapies, the numbers are still a bit smaller. For cancer, for example, for every 20 drugs that enter into clinical development, only one makes it through the other side, as shown, demonstrated safety and efficacy. In fact, a few years back, a team of researchers wanted to sort of track the progress of medical breakthroughs through to uh, uh, applications that could be used at the bedside for patients. So they took a pool of 100 breakthrough discoveries in the laboratories and found that only about 20% led to clinical trials that demonstrated safety and efficacy. And of these, only five ended up resulting in products that were licensed that, uh, that demonstrated sufficient enough efficacy and safety for a regulatory authority to approve them. The challenges in translating new approaches to the bedside are graphically illustrated with the example of endostatin, a drug that was discovered by this man, Judah Folkman, who devoted a career to understanding how tumors recruit their own blood supply. Now, when Folkman put endostatin to the test in animal studies, the drug vanquished tumors in mice. And so there was much anticipation as this drug progressed through to clinical testing. Indeed, so much excitement and enthusiasm that in a famous 1998 article in the New York Times, James Watson, the co-discoverer of the structure of DNA, was quoted as saying that Judah is going to cure cancer in two years. Needless to say, the stock of Entremed went up a lot more Monday morning. Indeed, there was so much enthusiasm about this drug that when initial human trials 
uh, were, were uh, started in Boston, 1,400 patients signed up for three slots in the clinical trial. But unfortunately, in the initial human trial and the phase two study that was subsequent to this study, there was no tumor response at all, and now 10 years after the first human study, endostatin remains a not licensed drug, a drug that has not yet demonstrated safety and efficacy. So my point is that many ideas make it to the threshold, make it to the gate of, uh, of, of human testing, but relatively few of these make it through to the other side as validated treatments. Now, you might be wondering, why is he going through all this? Well, my point is that every time a drug starts down that path from idea to product, if it turns out the drug is unsafe and ineffective, it means potentially that many patients are exposed to an unsafe and ineffective drug. And what's more, it means that many resources, both human as well as financial, are sunk into navigating dead ends. Nevertheless, I want to argue that we don't necessarily serve the interests of patients by denying them access to drugs that have not yet shown unequivocal evidence of efficacy and safety. It's well known, it's well established within contemporary medicine that uh, clinicians ought to help patients unfold their life plans according to their own values, a concept that we capture in the notion of patient autonomy. And while we might wonder why would patients want access to drugs that have so little evidence of efficacy and safety, we know from experience with illness that patients' preferences shift over the course of illness. What may seem like a foolish or foolhardy choice to a healthy person can look quite different from the standpoint of a patient who suffers from an untreatable disorder. And what's more, it's important to remember that se some segments of the patient community, in particular in the case of HIV activism, have shown a startling degree of sophistication and savvy with respect to medical information. And in the three cases that I began with, CCSVI, GDNF, and cetuximab, although the desires and the preferences of the patient communities that were clamoring for access were not necessarily aligned with consensus medical opinion, there were minority opinions within those medical communities that were supporting patient calls for access. Finally, I think there's something intuitively uh, set quite sensible in the uh, notion embedded in calls for access that as the severity of an unmet health need, need increases, we should be more willing to tolerate greater uncertainty about the efficacy and the safety of a new drug. So does this mean that we ought to allow patients with untreatable disorders to access drugs on a very, very slim evidence base, that is early in the trajectory from idea through to validated treatment? I think not necessarily, because private decisions about access have very important public consequences that need to be thought through. We know from the experience with air quality, for example, or the mortgage foreclosure crisis in the United States that the aggregate effect of many private decisions can have very significant adverse public consequences. And within medicine and debates about access, there's perhaps no better illustration of this than the example of high-dose chemotherapy, autologous bone marrow transplantation for the treatment of metastatic breast cancer. Sometime in the late 1980s, oncologists became interested in finding ways to deliver higher doses of chemotherapy to women with incurable breast cancer. And uh, the idea, of course, we all know, is that chemotherapy is very toxic. It's toxic to the bone marrow. So the approach that oncologists were trying to develop was an approach in which women um, with metastatic breast cancer would have their bone marrow removed. They would, be, they would receive very high doses of chemotherapy, doses that would be intolerable normally to a typical patient, but then they would have their bone marrow returned back to them. By the late 1980s, opinion within the oncology community began to shift decisively in favor of this, appro of this approach. And indeed, there were some preliminary studies. Uh, well, first of all, there were, there were commentators like the director of the breast cancer division at the National Cancer Institute in the United States, who quote, who's quoted the New York Times as saying, to my mind, the evidence is absolutely convincing that the dose intensity is correlated with survival. By the early 1990s, there were already small studies that showed a survival advantage for women receiving HDC, ABMT. So I would say at this point in the story, we were pretty far down the road in the trajectory from idea through to validated treatment. 
buoyed by these promising small clinical trials and enthusiasm in the oncology community, patients understandably began clamoring for access, in many cases suing their insurance companies for the $80,000 cost of receiving the unproven treatment. Many insurance companies relented. They were beaten in the courts. Indeed, it took 10 years to eventually put high-dose chemotherapy, ABMT, to the test of clinical trials. Part of the reason why it took so long is because it was very hard to find patients and clinicians who were willing to take a risk on being randomized to a treatment other than high-dose chemotherapy, ABMT. And when the studies first began emerging, year 2000, the, the results were not all that encouraging. There seemed to be no survival from women receiving high-dose chemotherapy, ABMT, and there was significantly higher rates of serious complications for these women. By the time HDC ABMT had run its course in the 1990s, $3.4 billion had been spent delivering an unproven and ultimately ineffective and unsafe procedure, exposing 43,000 women as well. We all know that our healthcare systems struggle to deliver safe and effective treatments uh, to people with unmet medical needs, and so. Uh, any resource we allocate to delivering unproven treatments potentially or even necessarily deprives other patients in a finite system uh, of their access to treatments that may in fact have demonstrable efficacy and safety. Similar arguments can be made for the question of at what point do we initiate clinical trials. Think of clinical trials as a very complex large web of collaboration among many different stakeholders. The entire enterprise collapses unless we sustain this kind of cooperation. So for example, patients need to cooperate with clinical investigators. They need to join clinical trials. They need to adhere to the protocols. Referring physicians need to refer their patients to the trials and need to say nice things about the clinical trial for a clinical trial enterprise to be a viable one. And there are three ways that allowing private decision making to dictate the terms of when trials are initiated can undermine the terms of this collaboration. The first is that it can potentially deplete scarce resources. That is, any time we begin exploring a hypothesis that doesn't rest on a bed of robust evidence, we risk um, depriving other more meritorious research programs uh, of resources that they need uh, to, uh, uh, to unfold, so equipment, personnel, money, et cetera. Secondly, uh, uh, untoward events in clinical trials can have ripple effects. There's perhaps no better illustration of this than the case in 1999 of a death of a relatively healthy volunteer in a gene transfer experiment. I use the word gene transfer. Other people use the word gene therapy. Uh, in this case, the unexpected uh, toxicity in this study uh, ultimately frustrated the ability of independent research teams pursuing related research to recruit the institutional support, money, and talent they needed to unfold their own research programs. And finally, allowing private decision making to dictate the terms of when trials are initiated ultimately can lower the confidence uh, and lower the quality of the research that's done. So let me explain this by likening the process of joining a clinical trial uh, to the process of taking your car to an auto mechanic, perhaps a, a, you know, a, a, an odd kind of analogy, but the idea here is that uh, when we go to an auto mechanic, if you're like me, uh, you may have misgivings about the quality of the mechanic, but you aren't necessarily qualified to judge the quality of your mechanic. Even after you've driven the car off the lot, you may be wondering whether you got a fair price and whether the mechanic did what the mechanic said they were going to do. Clinical trials are much like this. You have an asymmetry of information. That is, a patient is dependent on uh, the quality of the caregiver for the information they receive. In markets like this, it's very hard for consumers to reward high-quality producers and to punish low-quality uh, uh, producers. And as a result, in markets like this, the quality of product for clinical research, the quality of the science and the safety of the studies would tend to decline unless you had some kind of third party oversight of decisions about initiating uh, clinical trials. So all this is to say that private decisions about access and about initiating clinical trials have public consequences. Now, let me try to tie together uh, what I've said so far. 
I've said so far that the process of developing drugs is highly risky and uncertain. Very few of the interventions that start down that path make it through to the other side, unfortunately. But that nevertheless, patients have reasonable grounds for seeking access to interventions that have not yet demonstrated uh, definitive evidence of safety and efficacy. Indeed, I endorsed the notion that as the severity of an unmet health need increases, we ought to be willing to tolerate greater levels of uncertainty about the efficacy and safety of a treatment. However, um, many things that we care deeply about as a society, like a fair and solvent healthcare system, or a viable research enterprise, one can advance our capacity to address unmet health needs, depend in some way on, uh, on, our, um, on prudent, careful decision making at the point of initiating studies uh, and delivering treatment. In the end, the quest debates over access to unproven treatments really devolve to a question of balancing private interests against public interests. And much as science might be very useful and evidence might be very useful in adjudicating those debates, in the end, these debates are really about ethics and values, not about evidence and science. Now, reflecting on the experience with ABMT high-dose chemotherapy, several commentators have said that the episode cautions against allowing politics to overwhelm science in the area of evaluating experimental procedures. I want to draw a different lesson, and one that is in some ways uh, contrarian to this point. I want to argue that rather than needing less politics, we need more politics. We need more and diverse stakeholders participating in those decisions, those ethics and value-based decisions about the balance between private and public access. Recall I described the medical research enterprise as a very uh, extended, diverse, uh, extended form of collaboration among many different stakeholders. In an era in which the public is asked to pony up large sums of money to support biomedical research, or to grant tax credits to companies that develop drugs, or to universities for that matter. In an era in which decisions over access, evidence, and innovation touch our lives in very intimate and sometimes very unexpected ways, it's crucial that we establish mechanisms of public accountability for disputes and controversies surrounding access and evidence within medicine. And to that end, I want to suggest three possible ways of moving forward for uh, brokering some of these kinds of disputes and misalignments. Number one, I think that we would do well to enhance and improve the level of transparency surrounding decisions about access and evidence. Every time a health authority in the United States, the FDA, here in Canada, Health Canada, renders a decision to approve or to reject a drug, patient communities have some entitlement to understand the rationale and reasoning behind that decision. The US FDA and the European counterpart have underway right now uh, some really exciting initiatives to broaden the transparency and the accessibility of some of the decision making uh, that takes place in those agencies. And I think Health Canada would do well to emulate their example and to unfold their own proposals. Secondly, I think caretakers, clinicians, can do more to support and guide patient inquiry. Often when clinicians are approached by patients who may hold eccentric views or views that are outside the mainstream, it may be tempting for a clinician to simply quash those views, to dismiss them as being eccentric and outside the mainstream. And while there may be some circumstances where this is appropriate, I think a far better approach is for clinicians to be guiding patients and patient communities in prudent information gathering. Rather than telling them what works and what doesn't, work, what's proven and what's unproven, helping patients to ask the right questions of those who purport claims on behalf of unproven therapies. Has the uh, agent been tested in animals? Uh, can we discern a placebo effect from a non-placebo effect? Have the results been peer reviewed, et cetera, et cetera? And uh, I think that um, one example of an organization that I think has done an exemplary job, full disclosure, I serve on the ethics committee of this organization. Um, is the Institute uh, or the International Society for Stem Cell Research. Uh, they've put out uh, a web-based uh, resource for patients who might be considering stem cell tourism. And again, the emphasis in their resource is not so much on saying what is or is not validated, but rather helping patients to ask the right questions of those clinics that offer non-validated treatments. Last, I think we can do a better way 
a better job in the biomedical community of engaging patient communities, and not merely those patient communities that already endorse uh, the mainstream opinion within the medical community, but also patient communities that may have heterodox or, uh, uh, or, or um, uh, uh, views that are outside the mainstream uh, of medicine. And here, I think HIV advocacy and breast cancer advocacy uh, provide some examples where patients who hold really often quite different views in the mainstream medical community have really productively improved the research enterprise, not merely in their interfacing with patient communities, but also in helping to negotiate and contribute to setting a research agenda uh, and in helping to design uh, protocols and, for example, selection of endpoints in clinical trials. Now, uh, let me try to wrap this up. Um, and lay my cards on the table. I've described the debates about access as really debates that devolve into a question uh, of balancing private interests, private claims on access versus a public interest in restricting access until we have evidence about safety and efficacy. My own personal view on these issues is that we ought to be very careful as a society uh, 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 about granting access to interventions that have not yet demonstrated safety and efficacy. Uh, that, again, the um, viability of our healthcare system and the viability of the research enterprise, in my view, uh, would tend to favor waiting pretty, long, pretty far down that road in the trajectory of development before we begin to grant access. But that said, as I made clear, in a cooperative enterprise like biomedical research, in an era in which uh, uh, there's a great emphasis on patient empowerment, patients have access to the internet, and patients have access to clinics that are outside our national boundaries, it's crucial that we find mechanisms to engage disease advocates, even those disease advocates who hold views that are outside the mainstream of medicine. Uh, it's crucial that we develop accountability mechanisms for engaging those communities so that those communities when decisions are rendered on access that are unfavorable to the treatment preferences of those communities, they can at least grudgingly respect uh, the rationale and decision making uh, behind uh, those uh, uh, evaluations of evidence. I'll just close by thanking CIHR, which although they didn't fund this talk, they have funded a lot of the research that's gone into this talk. Thank you. I'm gonna invite the panelists to provide a brief comment uh, on my talk or other comments they might have on the issues of access. So I'll invite the panelists to come up and I'll introduce them very briefly. Uh, so uh, uh, Kerry Bowman is a bioethicist here at the University of Toronto. Uh, Tony Lang, neurologist here at the University of Toronto. And David Selchin, also a neurologist, in his case an MS specialist, and Tony Lang's case a Parkinson's disease specialist. Very interesting, Jonathan. Thank you. I, I hardly know what to say, so I'm, I'm going to, I've read a great deal on this. I've thought a lot about it. I've talked to a lot of patients, but I'm going to admit I did purposely not rehearse this because I, I wanted to just wait and see how it flowed and, and, you know, how it went. The thing that has struck me the most probably with the whole CCSVI emergence has, has really been the incredible gap between evidence-based medicine and the lived experience of illness that so many people with MS have. I, I originally did a small amount of media on this and, and immediately received you know, phone calls and was speaking to people that were living with the disease process. And the huge gap between what their lives were like, what the reality of what they were facing was like, and and you know, evidence-based medicine and waiting for things to change just struck me as so enormous. And the first reaction I had is, how did we ever get to a point where we're so far apart from the lived experience of illness in what it is we offer from a medical and research point of view? I'm not going to pretend that people with MS are some monolithic group that all think the same thing, because that is simply not true. Um, there are voices on all sides in the MS community, and hopefully we will hear some of that tonight. But, you know, what, what I was, what, what really struck me, it struck me when I spoke to patients, but it also struck me from reading the many blogs and such, was people were saying things like, this is the first time 
I've had a positive experience in healthcare in a decade. First time I have felt something positive in a decade. And, you know, then the message is it's not going to work, doesn't work, there's no evidence, right? And I, I'm not even taking a very fixed position on this. You, you might think I'm building to one. I'm actually not. I, I'm just talking about my actual observations. And so what really struck me is how did we get this far away from the reality of what patients are living with? That, that, that really struck me. And I believe me, I am nowhere near anti-science. I have been working in medical environments for a long time now. I, I, Evidence-based medicine is, you know, it, it's made tremendous progress. It has saved human lives, but it's less than perfect. Um, and, and you really see it when something like this comes along and you see how far away it is. We live in a democratic society. We live in a maturing democratic, evolving and maturing democratic society. Um, who owns the healthcare system? I would argue the people of Canada own it. And you could look at it provincially as well. So I would, you know, we need some democratic input from the voices of Canadians, including disease groups. And I'm not saying anything here radically different than what Jonathan, the points Jonathan has made in his concluding remarks. We absolutely need the voices of people um, and communities in the decision-making process. So that doesn't mean we derail everything we've already known. But, you know, in some cases, decisions are made um, in isolation and in a completely medical kind of a context um, with a complete absence of the lived experience of the disease process. And, and I, I do think we must have ways of having, you know, better input uh, into these kinds of processes. Um, you know, what's interesting is as you read through the blogs and you talk to people, how did we ever get to the point where hope is a negative or a dirty word? Can't have hope, can only have evidence. Hope is, is you know, the human life source. Hope is what makes us human. Hope is not a negative, irrational thing. This is how we live as human beings. So, you know, the last thing we ever want is an approach where something like hope is purposely suffocated in people because it's not rational. Um, you know, and, and the, the, the positioning with patients of you need to listen to science, you need to listen to logic, you need to listen to science, you need to listen to logic, it's such a long way from the reality of what patients are experiencing that I, I think what I'm hearing from patients is it's people find it actually offensive um, to be told only that because there's more going on than just that. So absolutely, we do need uh, much more public discourse. And in relation to ethics, I'm talking a lot longer than I thought I would. I thought I'd only talk for a minute. But anyway, I won't go on for much longer. You know, the, the, the ethical constructs are interesting as well because, you know, the arguments are often, well, you know, benefits really have to exceed risks. And so we can't do this one because benefits don't exceed risk. And I get it. But who gets to define benefits? You know, if benefits are defined purely from medical outcomes, is that truly fair? Do patients not have a right to define what a benefit is for them? My name is Tony Lang. I'm the director of the Division of Neurology at the University of Toronto, and I'm a Parkinson's clinical researcher. Um, I would emphasize uh, from the beginning that I spend a lot of my time with patients. And uh, one of the things that I find I try to do a great deal of that time is provide hope. Uh, sometimes that hope, in my mind, may be unrealistic if I'm dealing with a very serious degenerative disease for which I have very little hope of helping or improving with the treatments that I have available. But the last thing that I would do in that situation is deprive a patient of hope. And so I think that the good physicians caring for uh, patients with these very serious neurological diseases, uh, the good physicians are not suffocating hope at all. I hope what they're trying to do is provide some rational use of the therapies and provide an understanding of where a therapy may be reasonable or realistic in its hope or something that makes absolutely no sense from the perspective of what we understand about the disease. Now, one of the points that Jonathan made, you remember the side with the histograms uh, showing the poor um, outcome of drugs coming to market, and especially poor in the case of uh, cancer and uh, central nervous system disease. Uh, 
And one of the problems in central nervous system disease that I think is very important for patients to understand is how poor some of our models are of the diseases that we deal with. So for example, in the field that I specialize in particularly, Parkinson's disease, we do not have a good, reliable animal model. And so when a number of treatments come along that have been shown to be of some benefit in the models that we have, we have to have a very realistic understanding that just because you can improve a monkey or a rat, we're not necessarily improving the disease that my patients suffer from. So I think we have to be very practical in understanding of that effect. It provides the hope that we need to move on. In fact, you need that effect in, in the animals before we can move on, but we still need better models. And that's one of the reasons that that lousy outcome that you saw exists, is that we're just not dealing with diseases that we have enough understanding about and enough uh, ability to study them in what we call preclinical models, preclinical being before we get to patients. Now, another point that I'd like to make uh, in this re respect uh, deals with uh, one of the areas that I've spent a lot of my time in is uh, the fact that uh, Jonathan referred to drugs. I think we could just as easily replace a lot of what he said with surgery. And so there are a number of surgical treatments in our diseases that could be very easily um, interchanged with many of the things that uh, you've uh, seen there. And one of the areas that I've had to deal with and discuss extensively is the role of the placebo response in surgical trials. And so I thought one of the things you might be interested in is understanding what we're now learning about the placebo response in these trials. Because I think we have to have that on the table if we're going to talk about whether a treatment should be readily available to our patients. And we have to understand that the placebo response is a real one. It's a very physiological one. We now know that, for example, in Parkinson's disease, that patients can benefit from being told they're receiving a treatment that turns out to be a placebo. And at the time that they are benefiting, their brain is changing. We know that we can record changes in certain parts of the brain, even when the patient's taking a sugar pill. And we know that the dopamine that's so critical to the symptoms of Parkinson's disease increases in its release in the patient being given the placebo. So there is a very physiological, organic reason for that placebo response. It's not that the patient is fooled into thinking that they're receiving active treatment. It's that the brain is actually responding to the belief that it's receiving a treatment. The placebo response also stems from the physicians and the scientists as well. So I don't want people to go away thinking that the scientist is poking their finger at the patient saying, you think you're getting better, but you're not, and your brain is fooling you. In fact, scientists conducting studies can be convinced by seeing benefit from a variety of different reasons, excuse me, reasons. The way we rate these diseases, we can often see benefit based on um, unpredictable changes in rating scales. We also know that there are uh, scientists who have a great deal of vested interest in the belief that a treatment works. You saw, Jonathan told you about GDNF. I was the first author of the double-blind randomized control trial that told the scientific community that this was not effective or was no more effective than placebo, despite the fact that some patients felt very strongly that they were benefiting. And I was criticized quite heavily by some patients and families because I was part of the system that deprived them of what they felt was an effective therapy. All I could do was discuss the, the data as I saw it. Um, but what we did know was that there was a very clear placebo effect that um, in part was driven by earlier studies conducted by scientists who had their entire academic career on the line. There's one particular scientist in the United States who was telling me, this is a scientist, he, this is a bench scientist, telling me that I have to give this treatment to my patients with Parkinson's because I don't understand how serious Parkinson's disease is and how much my patients suffer from it. Whereas he works at the bench, I work at the bedside, and I see patients every day of the week, and I know the suffering they're going through, and I want to give them hope, but I don't want to put them at unnecessary risk, and if I'm going to give them that risk, I want some level of confidence that I'm giving them a treatment that will indeed help their underlying disease.
My name's Dan Selchin. I'm the director of the Division of Neurology at uh, St. Michael's Hospital and uh, work in the MS clinic at St. Michael's. And I've worked in an MS clinic for 25 years. Uh, I was reflecting a little bit on uh, what uh, the uh, last two panelists have said, and it reminded me of some interesting things. When I started treating MS, uh, we had no treatment for MS per se. We had treatments for a variety of symptoms, uh, but no treatment at all for the disease. And I was reminded by Tony's comments about the first major trial uh, that we engaged in at St. Michael's, which was uh, with a chemotherapeutic agent uh, called cyclophosphamide, which we still use occasionally for very severe cases of MS. And uh, this was a very large multi-center trial. And I remember that we as the investigators were completely convinced uh, that cyclophosphamide was working in our patients, totally convinced, because we kept seeing these patients who we brought into hospital, gave them their treatment, and they went home looking a heck of a lot better than uh, when they'd come in. And we were a little bit shocked uh, when we saw the uh, results of the large trial, which were dead negative uh, when it came to looking at objective outcomes. And then we sat back a little bit and thought about what we'd done. And what we'd done was take people usually with pretty bad disease, uh, bring them into a uh, hospital setting, uh, give them a ton of attention, hope, uh, physiotherapy, occupational therapy, and a lot of TLC. And lo and behold, they looked better when they went out. Uh, and they looked better whether they got drug, and they looked better whether, if, if they got placebo. So I certainly wouldn't want to uh, discount the, the notion of hope, uh, but I think uh, what Tony has said about placebos and the physiological effects of placebos is extremely important. I think there are other aspects, I think, that Jonathan touched on uh, in terms uh, as a clinician uh, where one's obligations and one's ethical obligations may lie. And one of one's ethical obligations is to inform and on some level to try to protect. And uh, there's a long history in uh, medical practice of uh, patients being uh, directed towards treatments uh, that are obviously and palpably of no value. They may instill hope, uh, but they, a lot of that hope in some instances is false hope, and I'm not sure that false hope is really uh, all that good for people in the long run in terms of where they go. Uh, they, uh, and uh, I think one of our obligations is to try and protect and not physically protect, uh, but to sit down and uh, look whenever we offer a therapy or whenever someone brings in a therapy, and I'll tell you in the MS universe, uh, novel therapies or therapies that are outside of the uh, scientific mainstream uh, didn't originate with CCSVI. Uh, the American Multiple Sclerosis Society published a small volume uh, about more than 25 years ago of uh, 200 treatments that were purported to be of value in MS, all of which had one thing in common, which was that when they were studied, none of them worked. Uh, so there was that one uh, unifying feature. And uh, I think uh, we have an obligation to uh, try and discuss with patients what works, what doesn't work, what makes sense, and to do that in a context where we're not, uh, where obviously our objective is not to rob people of hope, it's to try and protect them from a variety of different things, including gross misinformation, and sometimes, frankly, exploitation, which I think, uh, Jonathan, you were hinting at uh, in, the, uh, in, the, uh, in, the, uh, in your talk. Uh, but it's a, it's a very significant issue in this context. Uh, so I couldn't agree more with what uh, a couple of the speakers have said already, uh, that one of the th areas where the medical profession very often fails is in terms of listening, uh, 
and communication. I don't think there's any doubt about that. Uh, we're always in a hurry. We're too busy. Uh, we have certainly certain preconceived ideas. There's, uh, there's no question about that. One of the things I think uh, that we try and do in the kinds of contexts that Tony and I work in is uh, why do people come to a subspecialty clinic? It's not just because of its uh, of expertise, it's because the structure of the environment is such that uh, hopefully that there's a little bit more room uh, for discussion, education, uh, for a bit of a two-way street with regard to patients' concerns than there is in a conventional office setting. And that's certainly, uh, I know, uh, our objective. I don't know that we always achieve it. And I, I think I'll stop there because I suspect you have a lot of interesting ideas about this. If you have any comments or questions that you'd like to make, uh, by all means, I uh, feel very welcome. We have uh, two microphones here uh, towards the stairs. So uh, please, if you'd like, uh, come on down and uh, we'll take questions in turn. And we don't need to be uh, too fussy, so panel members uh, can feel free to jump in. And if they have questions for one another as well, um, we could entertain those as well. So why don't we start here? So uh, my name is Peter Pennyfather. I am in the um, uh, run the uh, Laboratory for Collaborative Diagnostics at the Leslie Dan Faculty of Pharmacy. So I, um, I teach courses in drug discovery, and I will actually take um, um, uh, try to disagree a little bit with the the idea that drug companies are the only people who can drug develop drugs. I mean, I, and I, or d develop therapies. And I and my, I would like to couch my comments on this observation uh, of control creep. You know, many trials which have a very uh, clear phase two efficacies, where where patients uh, who are treated with the experimental compound have significant improvements, which the marketers can say that if this was put on the market, it would be valued at X. Clinical trial happens, great cost is, is expended, and what happens is that the, the, the patients who are given the drugs get the desired uh, effect that's valued at a very high value, yet the controls who didn't receive the commercial product also uh, per, uh, uh, achieve the same sort of outcomes, patient-reported outcomes, or outcomes reported in various ways uh, designed by very uh, um, uh, careful uh, um, uh, 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 clinicians. Yet, the fact that those patients had significant improvements that, that had a, a strong economic value, that they are, that that's considered a failure, I think is really our major problem here. And, and I would couch this in, in saying that, um, that, that we talk about hope. But, uh, and, and you talked about tender loving care. Uh, uh, there's another example of a recent case uh, in the New England Journal of Medicine that was reported on um, uh, a, a trial with patients with uh, an incurable cancer. And they were, they were given a drug that will give them, uh, on average, a few months extra life. And uh, they were, they were tr testing this. And, and the trial was to, to compare that with um, palliative care started immediately rather than after the drug was, was shown not to have an effect. And the patients who were receiving the tender loving care in this clinical trial in an incurable cancer lived uh, twice as long as the patients who were simply treated uh, according to the standard, uh, st standard practices based on this idea of a, a magic bullet that will cure or prevent the disease. So I think there's a fundamental problem in the evidence that we're basing our therapies on, on the, you know, I, I believe in, in uh, animal models. I believe in peer review. I believe in, um, uh, what was the other thing? The, uh, that, and I also believe in the placebo effect. But what we need to do, I believe, is to transform our clinical trial uh, enterprise away from simply proving that there's products that financialists can, can sell on the market, not, not the drug market, but the financial markets. Uh, and look at all of these complex issues that happen when someone pays attention to someone with a chronic disease. And we have the technology now. We have uh, uh, the healthy home approach, the, the um, healthy at home approach of having uh, ongoing monitoring of people outside of the clinics. It's not that expensive. We could track on what caused that improvement in the control group. And I think that would be a major intervention to give not hope, but to actually start caring about these people who have chronic diseases.
So, so that's a comment, but I, I'd like to see your response to that. Okay. <laughs> I guess I'll just say something really briefly uh, uh, about this, which is um, I guess I am quite skeptical of, uh, you know, one of the challenges when you do, when, when you give a drug to a patient and you see a response is figuring out what caused that response. And I know Ross Upshur is in this audience, and Ross is a critic of, uh, you know, to some extent, of some of the kinds of methodologies that we use in, uh, in, 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 me in evidence-based medicine. But I think it's really a, a tremendous challenge to isolate the cause of disease response. And clinical trials are probably the most effective way of isolating that cause and isolating it from other kinds of variables that don't necessarily require delivering drugs. And so I tend to be a defender of the way we design clinical trials. Of course, there are lots of flaws in the way endpoints are chosen and the way studies are, you know, there's lots of problems with the way studies are, are designed, but generally, um, I, I guess I would sort of resist the notion that, uh, you know, we somehow should be backing away from the idea of doing trials and using a completely different model to validate treatments. One has to be really careful here. I mean, patients have different reasons for having, for holding to different beliefs. And they're not always based in science. And I think that, you know, when I made my point about patient autonomy, part of what patient autonomy is about is respecting patient belief systems, even if they may be radically different than those of the practitioner or those of the mainstream medical community. That's not to say that clinicians shouldn't try to persuade patients out of choices that look imprudent or uninformed. But I think one has to be really careful about endorsing the notion that really what we're up against is this knowledge deficit on this, you know, you know uh, that patients have some kind of a knowledge deficit that we need to correct and that where we somehow to transmit the information that uh, you know, we, the expert community, have that all these kinds of debates would dissolve. I think really this is less about information deficit and more about different uh, belief systems, different uh, worldviews. You know, I, I think uh, any clinician who's worth their salt uh, would agree completely with, uh, with what you've just said. Uh, I don't think most of us spend a lot of time discouraging people from uh, uh, using a whole range of different kinds of uh, psychological and other therapeutic interventions. Uh, I think where we tend to draw a certain kind of line is when uh, those, some of those, when uh, those interventions are potentially harmful, uh, at which point I think uh, we have a certain ethical obligation uh, to at least uh, verbally intervene. And in situations where we think uh, patients are being exploited, and uh, I have uh, I'll, uh, again, I'll speak to MS. Uh, probably 80% of my patients with MS, at some point or another, use evening primrose oil. A very nice substance, uh, totally harmless. Uh, totally useless in clinical trials. There have been, uh, there have been good trials which uh, suggest that it does the absolutely nothing, but it's never hurt anybody, and I can't tell you how many people I've seen who feel better when they use it. Now, why would I make an issue out of that uh, when a patient uh, is talking about doing something that has the potential uh, to cause significant harm uh, then autonomy is one end of it, one aspect of it, but there are other aspects as well. So let, let me just say one thing really yeah. quickly to that. So um, I agree with you, and uh, I would never want to discourage a clinician from trying to persuade their patients from undertaking a medical procedure that is an unsafe one or an imprudent one. I think my, my point is more that Clinicians want to engage those belief systems in, you know, a serious and thorough way um, if, in fact, the belief systems of a patient are compatible with the, you know, with, with, with the patient, then, then the persuasion should write those imprudent decisions. 
Um, but there may be some cases where patients hold views that simply don't align with those of a clinician, and I think that's where persuasion isn't, and you know, transfer of information simply isn't going to get you that far. Agree. I'm Heather Sampson, and uh, thank you, Jonathan. Um, uh, and I have to disclose that Jonathan and I work on a grant together. Um, but I'm responsible for the clinical research program at Toronto East General Hospital, and I'm a researcher. And I've just run up the road from a research ethics board meeting at the University Health Network. So that's part of the frame of reference I'm coming from. And I thought, Jonathan, on your third argument, when you got to the oversight slide, I thought you might have been going to slide into something. So I'm going to take the prerogative and go that way that our research ethics boards in Canada are charged with the oversight and approval of clinical research as it begins and on an annual review basis. And I wonder if this is the dynamic stage in our clinical research environment where we ought to be charging them, us, <coughs> with a far more engaged um, responsibility to be looking at the end results of the clinical trials and bringing them back to the research ethics boards and seeing where those results are going, seeing the outcomes, having a metric, getting involved in the next decision making. And certainly the National Multiple Sclerosis Society has a community-based participatory research um, at a chip in their whole mentality, and they're doing it terrifically, and, and so, do, so does Parkinson's to a certain extent, but there are loads of uh, disease processes that don't. Cardiology doesn't particularly, for example. Um, but whether that oversight at that third slide, if you could comment on, so not necessarily the ethics, but the, uh, the research ethics and the ethics of research where we could re redesign that a bit and bring our research ethics boards up to a, a 21st century position. <laughs> yeah, so a couple of thoughts here. Um, I guess I would be loath to expand the remit of institutional, you know, of, of IRBs or REBs, with, you know, in Canada, research ethics boards. Um, I guess I would be reluctant to say that their responsibilities should, have, should extend beyond the point where the trial is conducted. What I would say is that all the different stakeholders in that web that I presented bear ethical responsibilities, and at the point where a trial is put before an REB, in my view, most of the critical ethical thinking has already been done. So you'd really want to front end, you know, front load the ethical decision making into the way studies are designed and the selection of which studies go forward, et cetera. I also, I do think that there probably is some role for REBs in terms of monitoring whether trial results are published, uh, you know, whether trials are actually registered as they say they're registered. Um, so I can see roles for REBs beyond simply that moment before the study begins, but I, I actually think the ethical engagement belongs in other kinds of committees and other kinds of institutions than the REB at the point before the study, you know, long before the study and, and the point that uh, follows from the study. Interesting. Can I ask by whom? I'm on an REB and I, I don't know who's doing that research, that ethical it before it gets to oh, yes. So um, I would hope that sponsors and... I'm not asking hope. I'm asking knowledge. Yeah. <laughs> Fine. I think, uh, you know, when I put up that slide with, all, with this web of collaboration, every node in that collaboration um, is an ethical decision maker. Now, whether they're making ethically optimal <laughs> decisions is another question. But I think, you know, two of the There's panelists... Well, hold on. Two of the panelists here conduct clinical trials. Now, I would imagine that they probably go through some kind of rudimentary ethical decision-making when they decide whether to put their name on a protocol or whether to send it down the road to someone else to do. So I, I think that um, all these different stakeholders uh, go through some kind of decision-making process that engages with, you know, uh, ethical tenets. And... Um, Hopefully, if uh, medical students are getting the training they should be in, in ethics, they're incorporating that into their decision making when they sign on to a protocol. Thank you. Sorry, I jumped. Greg. Yeah, I just want to uh, stoke your ethical intuition pumps for a little bit and present maybe <laughs> a counterexample to what you're saying. So, a lot of you have said that you would deny access 
to patients for particular treatments if there's no sign of efficacy of said treatments. And a lot of the arguments that you've laid out are used in, a, in an analogous but different situation, and that is for people with extremely rare diseases. The difference in these cases is that these people, the, all the information that you're going to be looking for in order to be making these decisions as, you know, uh, as people treating them will probably never come to fruition just because there are so few people involved with what's going on, yet their access is denied on mostly the same grounds. And I'm wondering if you would advocate for maybe an earlier entry to the personal decision arena in cases like this, or if you feel your ethical arguments still stand. Can I, can I just ask a clarification? You're, sure. you're, you're saying uh, prevalent conditions versus rare conditions? I'm not sure if I completely understand the question. Well, the idea is that we typically deny access for, in rare condition. We deny access for rare conditions because there is no sign of efficacy for many of the drugs or treatments. Typically, sometimes they're off-label, so they've just never been studied for that and never will be because two or three people have this disease. So the kind of efficacy that many of you have said would be needed in order to treat someone with a potentially risky um, treatment will never be the case in this situation. Okay, I think I understand the question, yeah. thanks. Do you guys wanna take a go at that or? I see, I see the point. I'm not sure I completely agree. I think that um, I deal with a lot of very rare diseases as well. Parkinson's is the commonest disorder, but I deal with many very rare diseases for which you're right. Uh, it will be very difficult to um, come to a point where a randomized double-blind controlled, placebo-controlled trial will ever be done. On the other hand, I think that there are ways of studying therapies that may be logical. Um, hopefully we'll have some degree of uh, reason for doing it and a sense of safety that I think we still need to. That we don't, just because you're dealing with a rare disease that may not have a, a treatment available doesn't mean you put the patient at unnecessary risk to explore your interest. And then all of the other conflicts that exist in terms of drug companies, there are drug companies getting um, orphan label uh, agents that they can make money off of. There are uh, the scientists with still the conflicts that we referred to before, justifying their own research results. So I think we have to be cautious with all of the different things that we've referred to before that uh, stand in the way of uh, open access. We have to apply them, uh, I think, equally strongly, but I think that's the way I'd uh, address that. There actually is a mechanism to address this at both the FDA and at Health Canada in Europe, and this relates to so-called orphan diseases. So typically with common disorders, let's say cardiovascular diseases, um, you know, there's, a, there's quite a high bar that's set and typically one requires more than one randomized control trial to actually get a drug uh, accepted. But with certain types of uh, orphan or rare diseases, particularly those that, let's say, result in mortality. So for example, certain types of pediatric uh, cancers, in fact, the bar is much lower. And so in fact, randomized control trial data are not required and one might actually have a lesser degree uh, of, of evidence and there is a quite a different standard that's applied in terms of weighing the risk and the benefits. So in fact that issue is well recognized and I think is actually quite well uh, handled from an ethical and a scientific perspective in, in terms of the regulatory bodies. This is how, uh, for example, chemotherapeutic agents for certain types of rare cancers come into the clinic. So, so, uh, uh, so quickly. So there you're not dealing with a multiple year process. Often, you know, you may be literally dealing with a, a few month process from going from bench studies to actually going into uh, early phase clinical trials. Yeah, so, so I just think the only point that I would add to that is just that, uh, so I, I, I agree with that. I mean, if it is just simply impossible, materially impossible to reduce that uncertainty about establishing efficacy and safety, then one can't plausibly argue that we should maintain the same threshold of evidence. So for rare and ultra-rare disorders, there has to be a different evidentiary standard. I just add another point that I think is, is worth mentioning, and this uh, follows up one of Dan's points, that we have a number of treatments, for example, for multiple sclerosis. I have many treatments for Parkinson's disease, and so I have to put those available efficacious therapies into perspective when I start studying these treatments for common diseases. When you're dealing with a very rare disease that may have no treatment whatsoever, 
I think then my, if we're talking about the ethics of the participants in that very large complicated diagram, my ethics, I become an advocate for the patients. And here I struggle very hard to try to make therapies available to these diseases if they're logical. And as Michael says, we now have the ways of getting these drugs or these treatments uh, to the patients much earlier than maybe before. Thank you very much. My name is Hamid Rezi, and I'm a uh, research associate at the Faculty of Law with a background in oncology. So uh, the issue of hope and benefit was something that I was a little bit struggling with, especially in oncology, where the drugs are uh, marketed with, very, with evidence of marginal benefit, something like 1.2 months with high costs. And normally the results are based on surrogate markers in clinical trials. And we don't have a sound evidence of actually increasing the survival. It might be time to progression or uh, disease-free survival. So when we want to, as clinicians, when we want to talk with the patients and speak about hope, and at the same time, as uh, evidence-based medicine, if we want to employ that, how would you actually have a balance in giving the patient some hope and the real evidence of benefit, and how would you define the real benefit in this situation? I think it's relative. I think you decide on the basis of the, the knowledge that you have of the disease state, uh, the normal variability within that disease state, which is very important in terms of multiple sclerosis, where you have relapses and remissions very regularly. I think most um, uh, decision-making bodies that address the availability of these treatments are not satisfied with just results in surrogate markers. And uh, an example, again, I'll bring it because it's the field I know the best, is Parkinson's disease. We do positron emission tomography looking at the amount of dopamine in the brain. And in transplantations using fetal tissue, the dopamine positron emission tomography scans were markedly improved. Patients didn't respond but the PET scans showed tremendous benefit. So that was a surrogate marker that showed benefit, and the joke was that transplant was great for the PET scan, but didn't really help the patient. And so regulatory bodies did not approve the availability of this treatment because of that. So I think you, you do take things relatively speaking, and most bodies would not say two months of extra life uh, justifies the uh, marketing of a very expensive drug, especially if that comes with reduce quality of life because of toxicity of a chemotherapeutic agent, too. Um, but these are about the drugs that are marketed. And one example is cetuximab. For example, in uh, non-small cell lung cancer, it adds only 1.2 months to uh, disease-free survival, but still it's marketed. And we see that on a regular basis in oncology. So but, you, know, you know, I think what, what one does is you give the patients the absolute best facts with no, you know, the clarity that we, we do not believe that this may be useful and here's what we know, here's what we don't know. But hope is something that usually the patients tell you what hope means to them. And, you know, patients really under Canadian law have a right to say what value they will or don't put on a possible <laughs> treatment. There's exceptions to that, you know, with massive amounts of harm or something. But, you know, patients can determine what value they will put on what these possibilities are. Now, that, that's different if there's an immediate harm coming. But patients will tell you what hope means to them. You know, people will interpret that quite differently. But they, you know, I would never give them a distorted view of what, you know, these drugs might do. And I, I think you have a moral responsibility to be as clear as you possible, possibly can about the limitations. But, you know, for the patient that says, I need this, I really want to do it, I, you know, this matters to me, it's worth a risk, it's worth, you know, that's a value-based, because so it, it's the interface of science with the value of the patient, which is hope. Can I just ask you, you were referring to rituximab? Uh, cetuximab. Cetuximab, okay. Okay. All right, Agnes. Hi, my name is Agnes Blinska, I'm a PhD student here at the Institute. Uh, my question is about it's the ethical question that Jonathan raised in his presentation about weighing private versus public values. So on the one hand, we're, we've been talking about um, giving patients hope. And sometimes when a patient is, is dealing with a really serious disease, they're willing to put anything on the line and take risks that 
we wouldn't otherwise take. But then on the other hand, if we allow many patients to take these risks, uh, we deplete public resources. And I was hoping that the panel could speak a little bit about how we even begin to weigh private, um, private patient values to public values, which translate into other uh, private interests, uh, because they obviously translate into uh, other patients being depleted of resources. Uh, so I was just hoping we could, the panel could speak a little bit about how we even begin to weigh those two very um, disparate things. Well, I just want to say something really quickly in response. So I would hope that if I were facing a serious illness, that my clinician is not making that, is, is not doing that weighing. Um, I think probably all of us would agree here that clinicians at the bedside should not be, except in extraordinary circumstances, weighing off social interests against the interests of their patients. Mm -hmm. So that kind of decision making needs to be incorporated higher up at the policy level, at the institutional level, and at the regulatory level. Yeah, I, th I think me sitting at the bedside, uh, I see myself as the pa patient advocate. I'm there to fight for the best care and the most f effective and safe care I can provide for the patient. And if that means a lot of money, then I'm going to fight with the system to try to make that treatment available for, for the patient. And as uh, Jonathan said, I don't weigh the, you know, I'm, I'm not making the economic decisions at the time. I'm worried about Mrs. Smith that sits in front of me that I'm responsible for caring for. Yeah, you know, I'm interested, in, I, I agree with you there, but I'm interested in that higher level. How do we, how do we begin at, as policymakers to make these decisions? I mean, that's, it's, well, I think more, it's not as a, yeah. a question for, you as a physician with your patient. Well, th th the then, I, then I'll take my advocacy hat and, and go to government, for example, and then it comes down to my understanding of the disease, the impact of that therapy on the disease and the quality of life of patients, and if I believe that that treatment has made a tremendous difference in the patient's quality of life for reasons that usually I can understand, but sometimes I can't, then I'm going to way in favor of the public expense supporting it. Um, this then comes to the idea of some of the treatments that we've talked about uh, this evening, and I would have a great deal of difficulty making that supportive decision in a treatment that makes little sense to me that I don't believe works and that has not been shown to be effective in the usual way that we study treatments. I don't the. Uh the CCSVI example is a very interesting one in terms of the question that you're asking. I mean, I, I think one thing that would occur to me would be to remove politicians from the process, if at all possible. Uh, I look at uh, the money being thrown into the garbage can, doing completely useless thing, uh, doing retrospective studies of people who have had a treatment at public expense. Uh, I can assure you, we could, could find much better things to do with, uh, with the several million dollars uh, that, have, uh, that have been dedicated to that. Uh, I, I think on a broader scale, uh, this comes back to what uh, I think Jonathan was referring to, uh, that we need more equitable ways of having public input into, into, into policy making, uh, while at the same time uh, trying to protect science that makes sense. It's a very difficult equation. Mm -hmm. Just very briefly, I mean, there really is quite broad consensus that what's called resource allocation decisions should not and will not be made at the bedside. And as you've heard, physicians absolutely and other healthcare workers have a fundamental ethical right to advocate and fight for their patients, and they do. It's very clear. The problem sometimes is we're either not conscious that resources are influencing our position or we're conscious but we don't actually say it to patients. You see this a great deal in end-of-life conflict in which, no, we're not talking about resources, this is all but, you know, you've got a limited ICU space and you really are talking about resources but you pretend you're not. But that's a separate issue. Let's leave that alone. <laughs> Thank um, I'm also a PhD student, not here, but at Ryerson, and I'm looking into questions of patient-practitioner communication. Um, for me, this whole question of access opens up a broader ethical question, which is who has the right to make these decisions? Should it be the governing body? Should it be the physician? Should it be the patient? And I think that ties into the question of communication. and. If, 
if patients can access the information so that they can make intelligent decisions, hopefully with the assistance of their clinicians, are there ways that you could see of facilitating that communication so there can be greater transparency? It's great to talk about the need for greater patient input or transparency, Actually, but how do you accomplish that? I, I know it's not an easy question, I'd just like to get your input on it. Very carefully. <laughs> No, I, I mean, you know, one of the most, and you know, my students would get sick of hearing me say this, one of the most important things is to not get locked into a power struggle with patients and their families. It is so very destructive. And, and you know, the problem is people will not fully, both sides will not necessarily agree at what a benefit looks like. And a benefit to a patient may not be a medically sound benefit to a clinician. Largely, you know, every day in this country, these things are negotiated often, very often, very successfully and, and respectfully. And I think that is, you know, the way to go. It, it doesn't answer it on a systemic level, but there really has to be, and if you look at the spirit of, you know, the way healthcare is delivered in Canada, it really is an interplay between you know, the autonomy of the patient and the medical system and medical recommendations. I, mostly, I, I don't want to simplify it, mostly I think we get it right, but at times it can go very, very wrong and be very difficult. What do my colleagues think? Nothing further to add. <laughs> we do our best. <laughs> Struggle on. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know how satisfying an answer that is, but that's the best I can do anyway. Thank you. Good luck with your research, it's very important. I'm Ross Upshur, the aforementioned uh, skeptic about uh, uh, evidence-based medicine. Good. So let me, I, I think we've danced around some fundamental issues, but we haven't quite pulled them together yet. Um, so randomized control trials are non-ironically referred to as the gold standard for knowledge generation in clinical medicine. I say non-ironically because there is no modern economy that's still wedded to the gold standard. Um, so a very good philosopher, Nancy Cartwright, has written a lovely paper where she asks about whether RCTs are the gold standard and, and argues, I think, quite persuasively that if you can believe a lot of conditions are met by randomized control trials, ideally, uh, are met, then the conclusions that follow from them have a certain level of deductive certainty. The problem is, in the real world, we never get close to those conditions. So we have a lot of pseudo-scientific beliefs about balancing covariates. And one of the interesting things I've noticed in clinical trial reporting is that table one, which is meant to be, so randomization is supposed to give two groups that are comparable, right? The in intervention group and the placebo group are essentially each other, except they're the sort of uh, hypothetical twin group, except one gets the invention, one doesn't. Um, yet. Trialists now write longer and longer table ones to assure us that the randomization has been adequate and we've somehow got comparable groups and now we've got 25 or 30 covariates that are being measured. And of course, the trial isn't powered to detect difference in covariates at baseline anyways. So I, I, I'm delighted our, our, our mathematics teacher was up here saying we should know more about mathematics, I agree, but probably not statistics. I think we need another form of mathematics to actually get at what's going on. And I think this will pick up on something that Tony said earlier. So we spend a lot of time uh, trying to get clinical trials together. One randomized trial is precisely one flip of a coin. It, uh, and then how many randomized trials do you want? And, uh, you can meta-analyze them if you're not certain, and then you've got seven, and then my colleague Anjan will say, we've got a problem of induction here. How many randomized trials do you have to before you've actually got yourself some sort, even when you're working within some realm of uncertainty? You do not have proof, is what I'm trying to say. We spent, so I'm, I'm not so sold on the need for randomization, but I am very sold on the need for good controlled and well-designed controlled experiments. And the other thing that, uh, that uh, we, we, so we talked a lot about, spent a lot of time about randomization, but we do not spend enough time thinking about models that are testable in some way that are actually controlling for and getting us closer to the phenomenon that we want to study with the appropriate type of mathematics around that. So we need to invest a lot in appropriate causal models because a randomized control trial doesn't test any causal hypothesis 
uh, uh, contrary to all of my friends in clinical epidemiology who think it does, because you can have a large uh, randomized trial with garbage in and garbage out, uh, with no mechanism whatsoever, and in fact, for a lot of positive clinical trials, we don't have a workable measurement or mechanism underlying it. Think of hypertension, for example. So we need, to, we need to think about mechanism and science and control and building new forms of testing and new forms of mathematics before we can get at something. Because right now we're, on the ho we're hoisted, we're on the verge of being hoisted on the petard of a quite interesting paradox. Uh, and I'll use the MS because we've been dancing around this. So people don't want to do a clinical trial because there's no mechanism to support it. At the same time, as we're saying, we want to be evidence-based where pathophysiological reasoning, which was supposed to be displaced in the era of clinical trials, is at the bottom of the hierarchy. And the only way you have legitimate knowledge is to do a clinical trial in the first place. So we can't have it both ways. We can't discount a hypothesis on the basis of mechanism alone without having a clinical trial, yet we can't have a clinical trial, in my mind, without having a, a fairly reasonable understanding of the mechanism. So either we throw out the evidence hierarchy, which I would be happy to do, and start reconceptualizing how we think about disease and how we test uh, models of disease, uh, and we learn uh, better mathematics instead of relying upon R.A. Fisher and his uh, descendants. And I will stop there and ask the panel to comment. <laughs> so I, I, I'm just going to comment on the very last thing you said, because I'm not competent to, uh, to comment on most of it, uh, certainly from a statistical perspective. Uh, the issue of trials uh, with CCSVI, uh, the, uh, the issue wasn't so much an issue of biology or pathophysiology. Uh, the issue, certainly in the expert panel in Ottawa, uh, was uh, that what the panel wanted, uh, wanted was some evidence that the alleged findings in terms of imaging could actually distinguish between MS patients and non-MS patients. That, that was the real issue because there have been, in fact, been five published studies uh, in which blinded observers are completely unable to, uh, to tell the difference between people with MS and uh, people and controls uh, in terms of looking at their veins. So, 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 the, uh, so the issue uh, wasn't that the mechanism of, uh, of the uh, alleged treatment was implausible. Uh, the issue was that the condition doesn't exist. Period. But that would meet my standard of a yeah. of a well controlled study to test yeah. a hypothesis that was yeah. germane to uh, informing a uh, that doesn't defeat anything that I've argued. Actually, I think that actually supports, supports my it. way of my line of reasoning. So, <laughs> but publicly, we've got a paradox at hand. So, Ross, I was going to ask whether there's an index that comes with that question. Um, <laughs> So, so look, I mean, I guess I'm a big believer in uh, thinking of evidence as this kind of mosaic of different kinds of observations, and there are different kinds of methodologies that fill in pieces of that mosaic. I mean, to put the randomized control trial as the authoritative evidence of, uh, you know, authoritative definition of clinical utility, I think would be a grave mistake, and, you know, in, in that regard, I agree with you. I don't, you know, I think that uh, randomized control trials are really good at isolating causal variables. They aren't necessarily, they, they struggle to, you know, to um, isolate causal variables that are necessarily transferable to general practice settings, right? The conditions in which clinical trials are done often are very different than the clinical settings in which medicine is actually practiced. And so if one wants to really have robust claims about the clinical utility of an intervention, you can't go alone on randomized control trial information. So to that extent, I would agree with you. I teach a course called Studies in Propaganda at this university. I'm an alumnus and I'm teaching it as a volunteer, so it's a free course. And I've been doing it 11 years and one of my lectures is on bioethics. And what disturbs me is that end of life seems to be getting closer and closer, uh, regardless of what doctors and drug companies say. Uh, one instance would be that I have met a lot of students and they all need money and food who are selling themselves to certain drug companies for the weekend or the week, whatever, and they are paid certain amounts of money to go in and take uh, whatever is given to them. Now, to me, this isn't even a valid test because these are young people they're healthy people, they don't have the diseases that they're looking into, so I'm thinking, is the test really about, well, if it doesn't kill anybody, we'll go ahead with it. 
because I can't see any other reason for these stupid tests. Uh, secondly, in every massacre, homicide, suicide, we never get to see the medical record or what kind of chemical lobotomy uh, the person who has committed these crimes, what kind of chemical lobotomy they have been given, usually an SSRI. So I would say, uh, before we even start demanding uh, that our lives be saved or that we have health, first of all, the old adage, uh, do no harm. But this seems to be happening all the time and is covered up completely. And that's why I think good doctors like you are now connected in the public's mind with freebies from drug companies, tours, new cars, uh, uh, boat trips, whatever. And uh, people now, on the whole, do not really trust their doctors. And uh, to a large extent, that's why. One instance, in fact, when, while we're talking about uh, keeping uh, bad drugs uh, from getting out into the community and testing them and making sure they're safe before people take them, what about the opposite uh, type of thing where somebody like Rumsfeld uh, gets to push aspartame into everything we eat, and that has been connected with Parkinson's, I have to say. I've done a lot of research on that. Why is it that when somebody, a sadistic, and uh, he needs his own pill, can do that with something like aspartame, and actually, in old people's homes, the tables are loaded with aspartame. The doctors even take aspartame. All I'm asking for here is please, before you do anything, think of Hippocrates, please. Thank you. All right, so the panel I has three a... minutes to redeem the medical profession. <laughs> <laughs> I'll make a couple of, the first is um, your criticism of the uh, involvement of physicians and drug companies I think is a very important one. And one that I think um, physicians were very much uh, uh, guilty of in terms of abuses and uh, misbehaviors. Things have changed considerably, however, and institutions such as the University of Toronto have very stringent guidelines about physicians' involvement with industry nowadays that are very different than they used to be. And so the, the old day of the junkets and the golf, turn the golf uh, trips and things like that really don't exist anymore from the perspective of the uh, academicians who participate in these trials. And then on a lighter note, uh, you reminded me of Woody Allen's uh, Take the Money and Run, where he volunteered for a drug study, and the side effect was that he became a rabbi for the weekend. And you saw him reading the, uh, the Bible, and uh, so it, it, the side effects were known in uh, um, volunteers for a long time. I'll just add one thing really quickly. Um, actually, doctors do really well in terms of how members of the public rate their trustworthiness. It's actually, uh, you know, this is one thing that really hasn't changed. For decade after decade, uh, various polls have gone to the public to ask them which professions they trust the most and which ones they trust the least. It hasn't really changed very much. Lawyers get trusted the least, journalists the second least, and doctors the most, and scientists the second the most. So, so uh, I'd say the medical profession has done a pretty good job, uh, albeit an imperfect one, uh, uh, you know, safeguarding its trustworthiness. Uh, I want to thank the sponsors, our many sponsors, uh, especially the Canadian Centre for Ethics and Public Affairs and the Situating Science Knowledge Cluster. I want to thank uh, uh, Chris Stover and Emily Tector, who really uh, organized uh, the event. Uh, I wanted to thank the audience. I thought that the questions were uh, really uh, stimulating, important, and they really pushed our panel. Uh, and members of the panel, thank you so much, and especially our main presenter, Dr. Jonathan Kimmelman. Thank you. Uh, that's our uh, event for tonight, uh, and have a good evening, and we'll see you at the reception. Good night. <laughs>